Heels welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heels is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heels was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to talk about a couple of very simple things like LPLA. In fact, it's also a little bit complicated. Um, uh, first of all, I will bring some basics. Um, LPLA, we call it a mysterious brother of LDL because it contains of an LDL particle, as we can see here, and attached to that, is a glycoprotein which we call apolipoprotein A and that is the complicated part. So the apolipoprotein A has a high homology with plasminogen and the structure of plasminogen is shown here. It contains five different so-called Kringle structures, one to five, and a protease domain. And uh, the homology with plasminogen uh, for ApoA is quite high, but we are missing the first three Kringles and we have the Kringle 5 and the protease domain, and then we have a large number of Kringle 4 repeats. And this number of Kringle 4 repeats uh, is very different between the different persons. So we have a kind of polymorphism here. Um, we have between 11 and more than 50 copies of these Kringle 4 repeats. And each of these Kringle 4 repeats has a size of 5.6 kb, so it's per definition a copy number variation. And this is really hard to resolve, for example, by next generation sequencing. So this is one of the really last white spots on the human genetic map. Uh, we developed recently some methods how we can do that or how we can close to that. Uh, uh, and we learn a lot by that, but it is really a white spot, you could say. So the uh, molecular weight of this particle is between 300 and 800 kilodalton. So this is really a big molecule. So since it's not easy to resolve by uh, genetic investigations, we look in a phenotypic way uh, in the plasma. We do simply an sts chile electrophoresis, which is again quite complicated. It makes a lot of troubles. As, as it is shown here, we take plasma, put it on this sts agarose gel, and depending on the size or on the number of the Kringle 4 repeats, we can see that those persons who carry a low number of Kringle 4 repeats, uh, this protein is going more far into the gel, down into the gel. And if we have uh, a large number of Kringle 4 repeats, of course, then the protein is not going so far down into the gel. And here on the left side, you can see the nomenclature in terms of the number of Kringle 4 repeats. And up to 22 Kringle 4 repeats, we call them the small isoforms or the low molecular weight isoforms. And here above, we have above uh, 22, we have the large isoforms or high molecular weight isoforms. So this is the, the nature of this uh, polymorphism. So what is known, so this was the APOA particle, but now we are talking about the entire particle, like the LPLA, which we can measure in the clinical routine, uh, and, and here we look at the distribution of the LPLA concentration in the general population. We measured that in roughly 6,000 people from uh, southern Germany, and most of the people have low concentrations, meaning uh, concentrations below 10 milligram per deciliter. But we have roughly 25% of the population have concentrations above 30 milligram per deciliter. And this is accompanied by an increased risk for coronary artery disease. So it's a quite high frequency. And we, if we look at the frequency of patients who are subject with LPLA above 60 milligram per deciliter, there we have still 10% of the population. So this is a quite high uh, uh, concentration. 
It is also important to know and to understand that there is an indirect relationship between the number of Kringle 4 repeats on the x-axis and the LPLA concentrations. That means that persons who have these small isoforms, up to 22 Kringle 4 repeats, have in median uh, very high LPLA concentrations and above 22 Kringle 4 repeats the concentrations are uh, much, much lower. This is also an important characteristic. What, is, what else is known? Produced is it in the liver, the site of catabolism is not known. We have evidence that the kidney is involved. Uh, the LDL receptor also, it's an LDL-like particle, doesn't play a major role. The physiological function completely unknown. We have no clue about that. The concentration ranges very widely from 0.1 to more than 200, 300 uh, milligram per deciliter. And 50 to 70 percent are genetically controlled by the APOE gene locus. And the size polymorphisms with more than 30 isoform explains already between 30 and 70 percent. So that's much higher than 1 percent, as you mentioned, for example, for your phenotype. So it's a, a very strongly genetically controlled uh, protein. So from a clinical standpoint, it's very important to know that LPLA is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Uh, I bring you data from the Copenhagen City Heart Study, prospective study, looked at myocardial infarction, and they measured LPLA and used those who had the low concentrations below 5 mg per deciliter as a reference group. And when you look at uh, the increasing LPLA levels, you can clearly see that the risk is increasing as higher the LPLA uh, levels go up. And in the upper 10%, we can see that uh, those people who carry these high concentrations of LPLA have a 2 to 2.5 fold increased risk for a myocardial infarction. This is a quite strong uh, effect size. So it was already long known that high LPLA is associated with this coronary artery disease. But I remember very well in the middle of the 90s there was a big struggle whether this is simply an association or whether it's a causal association or, or whether it's a reverse causation. Meaning that if someone develops coronary heart disease, in the long run LPLA levels are going up. So this was a huge discussion. And uh, all of a sudden an idea came up which we call, call nowadays the Mendelian randomization approach, which I will ex uh, explain. Um, and this was actually the first time this type of study was performed already at the beginning of the 90s, which we call today the Mendelian randomization approach. And the idea behind this is as follows. If we know that the small EPOE isoforms are associated with this very high LPLA concentrations, we know that these isoforms are already determined at the time of conception. So that means if someone inherits a small isoform, that person will be exposed to very high LPLA concentrations their entire life. And if this is really true that high LPLA levels are associated with coronary heart disease, then we would expect that especially those people here develop coronary heart disease. So the very simple question was, do carriers of the small isoforms more often have coronary heart disease? And this was investigated the fir first time by Gerd Uttemann's group when he looked in multiple populations uh, in a group, always in groups with coronary heart disease and in control groups and looked simply at the frequency of the small epoisoforms and it turned out that in all of those populations, even if there are differences between the populations, uh, the uh, patients with coronary heart disease had a higher frequency of the small isoforms and the combined odds, combined odds ratio was 1.78. So later, a meta-analysis was uh, published with more than 7,000 cases more and more than 8,500 controls. And it turned out that those carriers of the small APOI isoforms had a doubling of the risk for uh, a, a coronary heart disease compared to, to those who have these large isoforms. So this is a pronounced effect size. So if we summarize that part, we can see small isoforms are associated with high concentrations of LPLA. High LPLA concentrations are associated with cardiovascular disease. And uh, small isoforms are associated with 
cardiovascular disease. And if we can create this triangle here, then this is a major support of causality. So if we can see that, then there's strong evidence that high LPLA levels are causally associated with cardiovascular disease. And we have always to consider that roughly 25 to 35 percent of the population carry those small epoi isoforms. So if we have a strong effect size with a very strong, uh, we have a very high frequency in the population, therefore it's a very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Or if we summarize that part of the talk with the figure, we can clearly see that there are people out there who are really at disadvantage by nature who carry these small EPOA isoforms. So is LPLA useful for risk prediction? I shortly mentioned only three studies which looked at different types of risk reclassification, natural reclassification and so on, and they all turned out that uh, adding LPLA measurement, for example, to, uh, for example, Framingham risk score or Reynolds risk scores, uh, really contributes uh, to a better definition uh, of the subjects who are at risk or at lower risk um, depending on the, on the concentration. What can we do against high LPLA levels? This is the, the, the story which is on the one hand sad, but there's big hope on the horizon. We know, for example, lipid aphoresis is lowering LPLA very strongly, but lowers also LDL cholesterol and also the endpoints, which is good. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, bring 25% of the population to lipid aphoresis. There are a couple of other medications here which were under development and many of them were not further developed, but they showed a decrease of LPLA. BCSK9 inhibitors, besides the very strong decrease in LDL cholesterol, also decrease LPLA by 10 to uh, uh, eight, uh, almost 40%. But the major hope is now Antisense technology against EPOA, which depending on the dose, decreases LPLA up to 80%, uh, as I would like to show you in the newest study from Sam Zimikas group, where we can clearly see here a, a pronounced decrease in LPLA concentrations uh, down to minus uh, 75%. And uh, uh, but we have to be honest, wait for outcome studies because lowering LPLA is the one side, but we have also to see whether that really uh, decreases uh, uh, the outcomes. So I would, in the final part of my talk, I would like to bring you some data which we are doing at the moment to find new genes on LPLA levels by genome-wide association studies. You might ask me the question, why the heck are you searching for new genes which have an influence on LPLA levels when you already know the major gene which explains roughly 50% of the LPLA concentration? The answer is very easy. We have no clue how LPLA is catabolized. And if, if we find here a gene, this might point us to the mechanism and the machinery how LPLA is catabolized. And uh, this could identify genes which point us um, to new research directions, meaning uh, that thus such genes could become uh, to new drug targets to influence LPLA levels. And even if we find a gene which explains only 0.5% of LPLA concentrations, it could, this could point us to these new directions uh, where we can really go on with further evaluation of uh, LPLA catabolism. So how was this done in former times? Uh, These were classical candidate gene studies. We selected a couple of genes, a few SNPs, and performed association studies with the phenotype of interest. This was clearly hypothesis driven. You had to have biochemical or physiological a priori knowledge. And by that, few genes have, were, were identified, which were the major genes, you could say. Nowadays, we're doing that by GWAS studies, and uh, we genotype up to 10 million SNPs uh, all over the genome. This is a hypothesis-free approach. No a priori knowledge is necessary. By that, you can identify new pathways. And for those who are not so familiar with those studies, a, a short introduction, you start out usually with the cohort, population-based or a case control study. 
genotype up to 10 million SNPs with a microarray, and then you make association studies with whatever phenotype you have measured. If you have measured a lot, you're doing a lot of GVAS. If you measure only one phenotype, let's say LPLA, for example, then you can do only one, um, uh, one of those studies. And you have to team up with other people who are doing the same because you need huge sample sizes to get really good results. So we call those QAMAS genome-wide association meta-analysis, uh, where you bring together the data from several studies. And I would like to show you how those GBAS have developed since the first GBAS was published in 2005 from macular degeneration here at the chromosomes. And this was the first GBAS result uh, published here on chromosome one for macular degeneration. Now you will see if uh, following uh, slides, how many new genes were discovered for various phenotypes. So there's a pronounced increase in the number of genes for different phenotypes. And in 2015, there were more than 2,000 publications, 15,000 SNPs, and more than 1,200 trades. So this was, was quite a, a success. And if we look, for example, in typical diseases, which we can see also in the uh, elderly people, we know, and this is not updated, we know, for example, uh, uh, lipid genes before 2007, 16 were known. In the meanwhile, we know almost 200. For all the other diseases listed here, you, we can roughly say this was a tenfold increase in the number of genes uh, detected by those um, uh, GWAS. But to be honest, for most of those genes, we have no clue how they are involved in those diseases. This will be a long-lasting story to clarify that. So we did our GWAS our, on LPLA concentrations. Uh, we uh, collected material from uh, five population-based studies, almost 14,000 people. We measured all LPLA concentrations in the same lab, in our lab in Innsbruck. We did also the EPOA isoforms by Western blot. Can you imagine doing Western blot in more than 13,000 people? Now, in the meanwhile, we have 25,000 people. And then we had also the uh, uh, GWAS and the, the G, uh, GWAS meta-analysis, and uh, I would like to show you the results. This is a typical Manhattan plot, which is the corporate design of a GWAS, where you can see here on the x-axis the chromosome, and on the y-axis you see always the negative logarithm of the p-value. Each dot is here a p-value from this 10 million SNPs. And here you see the green line here. This is the genome-wide significance threshold. We call it also internally the, the line of fun, because if it makes a SNP above that line here, then that particular gene makes fun to us, because then we have a genome-wide significant hit. Here we have the LPLA gene region uh, with 10 to the minus 400. It's probably one of the, the, the strongest associations we, we know from GIVAS. And if we look a little bit closer now in that particular region, uh, here's the LPLA gene region, we see in an extended region more than 2,000 SNPs which are significantly associated with LPLA levels. And in a special statistical procedure, we try to figure out uh, which or how many SNPs are independently contributing to LPLA levels. And finally, it turned out that 39 SNPs were independently associated, uh, independently from each other associated with LPLA concentrations. The other gene region which we found was the EPOE E gene region, which is a very famous uh, gene region uh, where we know that uh, we have three different alleles, E2, E3, E4, and many of you might know that the E4 is associated with Alzheimer's disease, for example. And here we looked in, a, in the CORA study in, in about 6,000 people, uh, the effect size on the different genotypes. If we say that the E33 is the, the wild type, then we can clearly see that those who carry an E2 allele uh, have uh, uh, lower LPLA concentrations. And we see that each copy of the EPOE2 allele decreases LPLA by 3.3 milligram per deciliter, which corresponds roughly to 15% of the mean concentrations. This is a quite strong effect size uh, of the EPOE polymorphism on LPLA concentrations. So if I summarize my talk, uh, LPLA belongs to the most important genetically determined risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The small EPOE isoforms which I have shown you underscore the causality of this association. 
and roughly 25 to 35 percent of the population have elevated LPLA concentrations and uh, uh, there are recommendations in preparation to start uh, screening for high, high LPLA levels. New drugs lowering LPLA are on the horizon, but we have to wait for uh, outcome studies. And in GWAS, we identified by the, uh, beside the LPLA locus also the APOE gene uh, as a contributor to LPLA levels. And we are currently extending our GWAS studies on LPLA uh, to hopefully come to a sample size of 50 to 60,000 samples. Uh, and hope that we find, will find further uh, genes which have an influence on LPLA levels and which hopefully will guide, uh, guide our future directions in research. And uh, let's say 15 years ago or 10 years ago, most of the people said LPLA is dead. And as I said recently in an in a, in a, in a editorial, there's still life in the old dog yet. And we recognize that uh, the research is really dramatically increasing now on this uh, atherogenic lipoprotein. Finally, I would like to th thank those people who, uh, uh, contribute, who contributed to this work. My people from the group in Innsbruck here, Claudia Lamin and uh, Salome Friedel, performed all the GWAS analysis and uh, a lot of people here in the lab who measured LPLA and did the uh, EPOI isoforms by Western blood. And I'm also very grateful for the collaborations uh, with the different studies that contributed uh, to our efforts, uh, brought material to our lab where we could measure it and did also the statistical analysis. I'm very grateful for that. And I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much for your lecture.